to say one thing. After studying Revelation for nine months, if you want to be attacked by Satan, study Revelation. <laughs> He's been messing with technology all morning. That was my phone that went off. I dropped the, the remote three times. He doesn't like to hear this word being taught. All right, I think we're good. I wanted to share at the beginning these blessings that we had in our first lesson. It's good to be reminded of this blessing and also the lessons that it brings us. We're blessed, it says in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 3, if we read it. We want to know what does it say. It doesn't work if we don't look at it and read it. But then secondly, we're blessed if we hear it. What does it mean? How do I understand it? Can I pay attention to it? Do I listen to it? But then we have to go on and keep it. And we ask that question, what should I do? What should I do now? How should I follow and obey what God has before us? And so as we look at this last section together, I want us to think about those questions. You know, in our messages, we've been thinking about the seven churches. And so I've been highlighting three ways that we can read these letters. The first one we call timely truth meaning these letters were written to real churches at the end of the first century. The Lord diagnosed exactly what they needed, and he gave them timely truth. But then also, it's, it's timeless truth. And these letters can be read at any time, anywhere, and apply to any church. And we've enjoyed how the Lord has shown us that. But also a timeline of truth, a a chronological view of the church age from Pentecost to rapture is seen in these seven churches in order. And so we went through the first four yesterday after our brothers had already gone through them. And I noticed, too, that there's a declension in the church as time goes by. But I enjoyed last night when Brother John shared about Philadelphia it warmed up a little bit, didn't it? There's revival. There's love, and it comes out in the, in the life of the church. And so I use those colors there to kind of simulate that cooling off. But there's still a wonderful opportunity for the Lord to work again as he has. So I just wanted to look at um, the next two. We're not going to cover Laodicea. Our brother Bobby will, will make it obvious what that refers to in our day today. But the church at Sardis, we can outline the years 1517 to 1750 A.D. And our brother Ken mentioned this is the dead church. This age started at a very specific date. It was October 20th, 1517. And that is because Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis to the church door in Wittenberg. And it changed the church literally in one day. What he saw there were things that shook the foundation of what the church was doing. There were mixing pagan rituals in with the church. In short, your salvation was a retail product. You could purchase it. And they used that money from indulgences to build St. Peter's Church in Rome. An amazing cost. But you know, in this time began what's called the Reformation. And as J. Vernon McGee said, back to the Bible. And that's what they needed. And so that was the big change from ritualism to the scriptures. And people wanted to know what the Bible said. Remember, for 300 years, they were forbidden to read the Word of God. But that is now opened. And so the Bible was taught, it was translated, it was printed, and guess what happened? People got saved. That's what happens when the Word of God is opened. And so revival spread across Europe and across the world, even though the Roman church tried to counter it very strongly with a counter-reformation. But we saw a wonderful recovery of the gospel. However, the church was still patterned after the structure of the Roman church. 
And many of the things that were there were left in place, uh, including infant baptism and things like that. And so there were still those who thought they were in the church, but they really weren't saved. But you know, those reformers became heroes. In my state of Minnesota, a large majority of the churches still have the name Luther on them. There's Luther Seminary there in St. Paul. Imagine having a church named after yourself. And largely then, since that time, uh, it's become quite dead, hasn't it? And the gospel might not even be made clear. But then we move to the church at Philadelphia. And now we can look at the years 1750 to 1900. And our brother John mentioned there's no criticism of this church in that letter. They were the faithful church. And because of the light of the Reformation and the opening of the word, people studied and searched the scriptures again. And, and not only was the gospel recovered, so was the truth on the church and the teaching of, of the rapture. The letter mentions an open door, and the doors were wide open now for the gospel. We had the Great Awakening with George Whitfield and John Wesley. Other preachers like Charles Spurgeon and D.L. Moody. Did you know D.L. Moody came to Oakland in 1889? I wonder if some were saved then that have carried through that tradition, through the heritage of the gospel, and maybe someone here is a result of that work. Do you know... Um, George Mueller was in Oakland as well. And we see how God opened that door, not only in the gospel, but also in the missionary movement. And the desire was to, to spread the word to the world, and Hudson Taylor and William Carey and David Livingstone, among others. But as more people were looking at the Bible, it also received more critics, even in the Christian universities in Europe. They were questioning the, uh, the inspiration of, of Scripture and higher criticism developed. And so, yes, even in a great time, things still fade. And that brought us to the 1900s, or perhaps we can see the beginning of the Laodicean age. But now we're going to move on to chapter 6. I was on a flight once to Miami, and the pilot came on the PA, and he said, I just want to let you know, we're going to have some rough air ahead. But the good news is, it's all going to be over in 30 minutes, and I'll have you on the ground, and you'll be on the beach by 3 p.m. And so today, we're going to have a bumpy ride. But I can guarantee you it'll be over in 30 minutes <laughs> and God will safely land the plane. So fasten your seatbelt. As we've been looking at this story, we've seen the scene alternating from heaven to earth. And now we've been up in heaven as John is seeing this wonderful worship scene. But it's going to move back down to earth now, which shows us how that prayer the Lord taught his disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven will finally, for the first time, completely come to pass. And so obviously now we are in the third part of our outline that began at chapter four that we looked at yesterday. He's to write the things which will take place after this. This is now future. Everything is future. And so in chapters 4 and 5, we saw joy in heaven. But now, beginning at chapter 6, we see justice on earth. In chapter 4 and verse 1, we saw an open door in heaven. Remember, open things are a key in the book of Revelation. And now in chapter 6 and verse 1, we're going to see open seals upon the earth. But God wanted to make sure that John had a vision of what was really happening up in heaven, that God was on the throne. Before he's going to see all of this horror, he reminds him that the throne is set. So what is this justice on the earth all about? Well, 2,000 years ago, when the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, the announcement was peace on earth. 
He brought peace. He is our peace, it tells us in Ephesians. He made peace through the blood of his cross. He preached peace. Therefore, if you don't want his peace, all that's left for you is war. And that's what the rest of the book is about. It's called the wrath of the Lamb. But none of what we're going to see happen will happen before the rapture of the church. That's why that outline is so important. As our brother mentioned yesterday, the rapture of the church is such an important truth for us. And what we would believe is that it's a pre-tribulation rapture. Before those seven years of judgment come, we will be removed and on heaven. But imagine in those other views our brother was mentioning that he had to study in seminary. If you were one who believed in the mid-tribulation rapture, that you would endure the first three and a half years of that judgment. Or what if you were a post-tribulation rapture person and you had to sit through the whole tribulation for seven years? And so it's hard to interpret these chapters ahead. And there's many views, as I've just shown. I remember cruising through the early chapters of Revelation and thinking, I enjoyed this. I had a great summer in Revelation 4 and 5. But then it gets dark. And it gets complex. And then you look at all the charts. <laughs> you know, these are good charts when I get into them, but they're just confusing. <laughs> and then you turn to your favorite writers and your favorite preachers, and you're surprised to see that none of them agree. Even dear brothers. And so you can't be too dogmatic on some of these very detailed things. We have to be gracious here. And the order and the timing of the judgments has all kinds of interpretation. Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pre-millennial, post-millennial, amillennial. And the more books I read on Revelation, the more dizzy I got. <laughs> and so what did I do? I went back to where I started. I like to keep it simple. And that outline saves my life. Three points and the number seven. And so what we're going to see today are three series of judgments. No matter how you look at these things, it's clear there are three series of judgments. There are seven seals followed by seven trumpets followed by seven bowls. They're in consecutive order. And here's how it works. A seal is opened in heaven and judgment comes upon, upon the earth. And then it goes through all six seals. It comes to the seventh seal. It's opened. And out of the seventh seal comes the seven trumpets. You go through the seven trumpets. And at the seventh trumpet, when that opens, out of that comes the seven bowls. Someone described it like opening an old-fashioned telescope. One just comes out of the other. But to make it even harder, there are these parentheses between these. Remember these interruptions. I talked about the baseball announcer. Between the innings, he gives you a little commentary. And John is going to do this to let us know what is happening. But we can follow those judgments. And as you see them progress, they become more and more intense. Because they're driving a pathway down to the final climax. But to help us, it might be good to see that with each of the three series of judgment, there are three rulers over the world. Under the seven seals, we'll see as man rules the world. How's that going to go? And then under the seven trumpets, Satan will rule the world. But then under the seven bowls, Christ will rule the world. So let's begin with the seven seals. Man rules the world. And a seal is opened up by the Lord Jesus of that scroll, and judgment comes to the earth. Why does that happen? Because man has rejected God's rule, so God is going to remove all of his influence for good 
that he had shown them. He removes his peace. He removes his mercy. He removes his grace. He removes his people, the church. And as I mentioned, when the church is gone, it's going to change this world. Because what will be gone is the influence of the Holy Spirit in the believer. And the influence of the word of God in the believer. And the influence of the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling in the believer. God can still reach people, but what a changed earth. What does that mean for us today? What should we do in response to that since this is coming? What kind of people should we be? And so the Lord just says, let's see how things go without my help. And they're left to fend for themselves. Let's let man rule the world. You see, they don't want law and order. They don't want absolutes. They don't want right and wrong. They want to be free to do what they want to do. And that is very familiar to us, isn't it, in our day today? It sounds just like what we see. Two summers ago, in my hometown of Minneapolis and St. Paul, after George Floyd died, our city council voted and said, we don't want the police. Let's get rid of them. Let's let the people run the city ourselves. And we went through three days of riots and anarchy. They set the police station on fire. 330 buildings were burned to the ground. I was a mile away from that in St. Paul where I live. The the rioters took all they wanted from the stores. No one stopped them until finally the governor had to step in and overrule the foolish mayors of the city and brought in the National Guard to restore order. None of us went to work. Every single business was covered with plywood. My whole main street was just, it looked like it was crated up, ready to be shipped out. We were in curfew at night after sundown. My neighbors in my quiet neighborhood were out on their front lawns with their fire pits and their guns in their hand to protect their homes. In the strangest scene I saw, a flatbed truck pulled up and unbolted all of the mailboxes and took them away. We found out the post office did it because of fear of terrorism that would be uh, sent through the mail. The Humvees, the the military riot vehicles, were coming down my elm-lined street. Fear gripped the neighborhood. You could feel it. It felt like an apocalypse right before our eyes. Now, you multiply that by a million, and you have a little idea of what it will be like during this time. And it takes just 17 verses in chapter 6 and the whole world is left in complete anarchy. And as we look at these seven seals, you'll see a picture of a pattern we've seen before. The first one, John says, he looked and behold a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. Well, that sounds good, right? That's the Lord Jesus. No, it's not. The only comparison is a white horse. It's deception. He's promising peace and safety. And wasn't that the cry that Paul wrote to the Thessalonians when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall come upon them. That's what we need. We need a peacemaker. But it's not peace. Without the Holy Spirit around, people will believe anything. And then the second seal is opened, another horse, this time a red horse. And it says, it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. So now what do we see? We see war. That peace didn't last very long, did it? And then the third seal is opened, and this time it's a black horse. But in his hand is a pair of scales, a balance. And it tells us he's weighing out the grain because food is scarce. There's famine. There's no food. 
And that follows war, doesn't it? And then the fourth seal is opened, and it's a pale horse, and the one who sat on it was death and Hades. Notice this, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. That famine caused death, and then it says with death, and that's talking about pestilence, disease. Now notice the power to kill. It says a fourth of the earth dies. If we have 7.7 billion people today, that would be almost 2 billion people perish in the fourth seal. And then the fifth seal is opened, and he sees under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. This is the cry of the martyrs. The ones who, who have been saved in the tribulation are, are crying out and say, Lord, how long until you judge? When will this be over? When will righteousness, righteousness come? And then the sixth seal, and we see these great changes in creation. There's a great earthquake. The sun is as black as sackcloth. The moon became like blood. The stars fall to the earth, and the sky rolls up like a scroll. You know, when you sing those words, and it is well with my soul, that's what this is talking about. Like a window shade, it just rolls away. The mountains and the islands are removed. What does that cause? It causes panic. It says in 15 that the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, everyone hid themselves in the caves and they said, fall on us to the rocks and the mountains. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. These are the earth dwellers saying that. They're understanding this is the wrath of the lamb. So think of what we've seen, war, and then famine, pestilence, persecution, and panic. Things we see in our own world. People in our day today might think the end times have started, but they haven't. You know why? It's because of our outline. We won't be here. We will be home with the Lord Jesus. The point is this, what we see happening in our world today is a foreshadow being cast upon our day of what's coming. And now we can see how it could even be more possible. Could a disease spread around the world? Is that possible? And look what it says at the end of verse 17. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Who can stand against this judgment? This is real. People are recognizing this is judgment. And so man tries to rule the world. How does that go? They leave the world as a complete disaster. And then we come to the seventh seal in chapter 8. And it says there's silence in heaven for a half hour. Imagine that calm before the storm. They know it's going to be horrible. And as that seventh seal is open, John sees seven angels appear with seven trumpets. And so now we come to the seven trumpets judgment. And now Satan rules the world. And we read this in verse 7. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood. A third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. We lose a third of our trees. The second trumpet sounds, and it says something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Notice that something like, remember our figures of speech? That's a simile. Something like a rock that's burning. It sounds a little bit like a meteor, doesn't it? It kills a third of the creatures in the sea. It destroys a third of the ships, and a third of the sea is turned to blood. The third trumpet sounds, a great star falls from heaven burning like a torch. It fell on a third of the rivers and the waters. Like a torch, a star with a torch. What does that sound like? Perhaps like a comet. It poisons a third of the fresh water of the earth. And John says many die from that poisonous, bitter water. 
The fourth trumpet sounds, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars. It was darkened by a third. What would happen to our earth if we lost a third of our light? And John hears a voice. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But you know, they're not crying out over what has happened. They know what's coming in these last three judgments. In fact, in chapter 9, it takes half the chapter to describe the fifth judgment. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet. I saw a star fall from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. This is not a celestial body. This is Satan himself. He's been given that key to unleash the demons which have been locked in the bottomless pit. They are bound there by God. They take on these forms. They're like locusts and they swarm up over the earth. They're going to terrorize the earth. They have a sting like a scorpion, but their victims are in agony, but they cannot uh, die. They want to die, but they can't die. And then the sixth trumpet comes and four angels are released who are bound at the river Euphrates where Babylon was. And as that is unleashed, there's a massive army of 200 million of his followers. And it said they were prepared to release to kill a third of mankind. Now think of it. A third of the people of the world already died back in the fourth seal. And now, I'm sorry, a fourth did. And now a third is added to that with fire, smoke, and brimstone. A quarter plus a third, you're at about 60% of the world is dead by the sixth trumpet. But what happens? They did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. This tells us that wrath is deserved. All those opportunities God has given man to repent and they still refused. So man's rule didn't fail or failed miserably. It didn't work. So Satan rules the world. But really, who was working behind man even then? And so now the devil is going to step in. And he's ready to deceive because this world is in a, a vulnerable position. Who can help us now? Give us a leader. Give us a man. And Satan says, I've got just the one you need. But John says, I can't even call him a man. He calls him the beast. And John steps on the shore of the Mediterranean and he looks to the west, to the sea, and he sees this eerie sight. A beast arises out of the sea with seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. The beast out of the sea. The sea often pictures the Gentiles. So here's a, a Gentile powered by Satan quite possibly a European, so maybe he'll start with Europe. Could you ever unite Europe under one leader? What did we see in 1993 with the European Union? And he's going to have many features of that old Roman Empire, but it's going to surpass it in every way. There'll be an empire he creates like this world has never seen. It will start to dominate, not just in Europe, but expand. And eventually, he'll dominate the earth politically, religiously, and commercially. And to kick his plan into action, he signs a peace treaty with the nation of Israel. It's going to last seven years, he says. Is he going to keep that? Daniel tells us about that. He has Israel rebuild their temple. And they think, what a great person. We can continue to build our temple. He promises that Israel will be protected. Now, can you imagine what it would be like in that day to rebuild the temple of Israel on that mount in that land? You see, he doesn't really want Israel to have that temple for themselves. He wants it for himself. But this first beast is going to have a partner, a cohort. 
And in, in chapter 13 and verse 11, he sees another beast. But this one comes up out of the earth. You have a beast out of the sea, the Gentiles, and a beast out of the land, often referring to Israel. So quite possibly a Jew. It says he had two horns like a lamb. He seems gentle and mild. But how does he speak? He speaks like a dragon. He's a deceiver. And the Bible also calls him the false prophet. His job is to be the advertising agency for the first beast. He's going to promote him and market him to the world. And their plan is perfect. The world is so messed up, this first beast can step in and become the savior to this world. He forces the armies of the world to join his side. He is so strong, what can they do? It says in verse 4 of 13, they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? The dragon. And now we have before us an unholy trinity. This is the worst triplet in the book of Revelation. You have the Satan, the dragon. You have the first beast, the beast out of the sea, and you have the false prophet waging war against God's holy trinity. So all of the armies of the world are coming together under the control of the beast. And that's what Satan has wanted all these years, to unite everyone. And now the beast isn't just ruling his empire, it's expanded to the whole world. And we come to the midpoint of the tribulation now, in just three and a half years. And what happens at the midpoint of the tribulation? God has two witnesses, powerful witnesses, doing miracles. They can shoot fire out of their mouths. But the beast kills them. He leaves their bodies on the streets of Jerusalem for three days. Everyone sees it on their screens around the world. And they celebrate. The beast has conquered. The great apostate religion is totally destroyed. We see that in Revelation 17, verse 8. You know, the church is called the bride. What's the false church called? It's called the harlot. Apostate church. All things religious pertaining to that are, are outlined. They burn the churches. Their money is taken. And it opens the way for a new religion. He rips up that peace treaty with the Jews. He used Israel to help him get where he wanted to be, but now he turns against them. He takes their temple. And it begins a horrible persecution of the Jews, known in the Old Testament as the time of Jacob's trouble, or known in the Gospel of Matthew and in the book of Revelation as the Great Tribulation. Note that the Great Tribulation is the last three and a half years of the Tribulation. And he begins to destroy the Jews. He persecutes those who were saved by the 144,000 gospel preachers of the tribulation. Whom God had converted to tell the truth of who is the ruler. And this persecution is extreme. He desecrates the temple. And he puts his own image in it. He sits in the temple as God. As we read in 2 Thessalonians. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Who are you going to worship? And the false prophet goes on and he brings deception to the people to get them to worship the beast. He'll even set up an idol to the beast and use his demonic powers to animate it so he can speak and Further convincing people, yes, this is the one to worship. They're commanded to receive the mark of the beast. If you want to live, you have to bow to the beast. Without that mark, you can't buy anything. Imagine going into the grocery store. The shelves are almost empty, but you're hungry. You want a loaf of bread, but grain has been scarce. You want a fresh bottle of water, but everything's poisoned. You find something and you put it on the counter and they say, where's your mark? If you don't have a mark, you can't buy, you can't sell. What a horrible time to be in. But where will we be? 
Remember, we're up in heaven. So who's behind all of this? Satan is, you, is using the beast, but he's you, uh, ruling the world. And so things are funneling down now to a choice. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to worship? Are you going to worship Satan through the beast or God through the lamb? It's that choice that has been made through the centuries. And so now we come to the third series of judgment. Under the seven seals, we had man ruling the world. That didn't work. In the seven trumpets, Satan rules the world, and that seems to be working. But now we have the seven bowls, and Christ rules the world. Now these seven judgments come in rapid-fire order. There's no delay here. It reminds me of being at a fireworks display. At the grand finale, they shoot everything off at once. And that's what happens here. The first bowl is poured out on the earth, and it brings these painful cancerous sores on those who worship the beast. And then the second bowl is poured out, and it turns the oceans to blood. It kills every living thing in the sea. The third bowl does the same thing on the rest of the waters. Notice, now God is no longer destroying by thirds. It's complete destruction. The fourth bowl is poured out onto the sun. It's so hot, men are scorched with fire. But what do they do? It says they do not repent and they blaspheme God even after all of this. The fifth bowl comes and it fills the world with darkness, including the beast and his kingdom. And the pain from those sores is so intense, it says they gnaw their tongues in agony. And they still did not repent, it says again. Now think of that, boils on the skin, blood in the waters, darkness. What does that remind you of? The same thing that was brought to the Egyptians, the plagues. The sixth bowl is poured into the Euphrates. There's the Euphrates again. And this time it dries up the river. It allows a way now for the kings of the east who have been marching towards Israel. And they have an easy access and they come to wage war at Armageddon. In the Hebrew called Armageddon. The plains of Megiddo are a historic place in battles of Israel, such as in Judges with the Canaanites, and Gideon's victory over the Midianites. Many, many years later, Napoleon himself came to that site, and he said, this would be a great place for a battle. Little did he know. And now comes the seventh bowl, and it begins with this announcement, it is done, it is finished. And out comes an earthquake, the greatest earthquake that has ever been seen in the history of this earth. And that great city, that's Jerusalem, is split into three parts. John says every island disappears, the mountains are no longer, and these giant hailstones, a hundred pound each, destroy. But what do men do? Again, at the end, they blasphemed God because of it. The destruction is great, but for now, it's done. It's a horrible time. And so they're all meeting there for battle. But suddenly, up in the sky, who is it? It's the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's coming again. But he's not alone. His saints are with them. He's on a white horse. And the sword comes out of his mouth, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so begins the the last great battle, the battle of Armageddon. But don't blink. You might miss it. Why do we call it a battle at all? It's over in a word. It's over in a word. And it says, an angel stood in the sun, and he cried with a voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. And they eat up the flesh of kings and and everyone. It says in Revelation 19, then, that the beast and the false prophet are captured, and they're cast into the lake of fire forever. Chapter 20 comes, and then comes the millennium. 
Satan is chained and he, he's bound in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And so now the earth has been cleared and the Lord can reign on the earth with His saints for a thousand years. But we know that after that thousand years are up, Satan is released for a time and he, he causes a rebellion. Who's going to go with Satan? Well, those who were born during the millennium don't know the Lord. Perhaps they too will join this rebellion, but the Lord casts it down in an instant. And then the great white throne judgment. And all those who rejected the Lord Jesus are standing before that judgment. They're judged, they're all guilty, but then their punishment is based upon their work. Then we come to 21, and we have the new creation, a new heaven, a new earth, a new city, the new Jerusalem. It's all new. What's it going to be like? John describes it, and it's hard to make sense of it. All I can agree is with the songwriter who said, how beautiful heaven must be, the home of the happy and free. It's beautiful. It's a place. The Lord said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. He created the earth in six days, but he's sure been taking a long time to prepare heaven. How beautiful is that going to be? It's huge. 1,500 miles in a cube shape. It takes up half the state of the United States. It's huge. It says this, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. Remember our goal? Look for the throne. Who's on the throne? God and the Lamb. Who's there? His servants. We've arrived. What a wonderful thing. John is overwhelmed. He's exhausted. I think he sits down. He puts down his pen. The Lord says, just a minute. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I have three more things to tell you. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Surely, I am coming quickly. And we agree. We say, even so, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And I love the last verse. You know how it ends? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Remember, we began with grace. What is grace doing in Revelation? We learn in Ephesians, in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding kindness of the riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. So what should we do? You know, we read Revelation sometimes and we just, we look at all the spectacular things, but we walk away and we, we go back to what we were doing. But what should we do? Well, here's what the Lord says in verse 7 in one of those messages, Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Keep these words. It means allow your life to be controlled by the word of God. In light of what we've read, obey what he has said. Keep his words. How do we do that? How do we keep his words? One of my favorite passages is what Paul shared with Titus. And he gives him three things to do. How to live in light of all of this. The first thing he says in Titus 2.11 is to share Christ. He says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Christ has come. There's the gospel. He came and he died for us. And now share that with the world. Tell them to flee from the wrath to come. And then he says this, live for Christ. Because the, the gospel and the fact that he has saved us teaches us that we should live godly now. Our influence now is upon those who don't know the Lord. We should live righteously in our sanctification, it describes here. But then thirdly, we should look for Christ. Look for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. You see two appearings? He came the first time and he's coming again. And what's between that? The church age. And so we should do these things. Share Christ. Live for Christ. Look for Christ. Now let me give you my sound bite I want to leave with you at the end of the conference. This is what I want you to take home. Revelation is the great priority adjuster. Do you need your priorities adjusted? Study Revelation. 
What difference does it make all these trivial things I do right now? I need to share Christ. I need to live for Christ and walk in holiness. And I need to look for Christ expectantly, knowing He is coming. And so that is a panorama of revelation. And all we can say is, hallelujah, what a Savior.